Thank you for coming everybody and welcome to our talk tonight. Um, my name is Jess, I work for Devon Biodiversity Record Centre uh, with the Green Minds Project, so I'll be hosting this evening. So Devon Wildlife Trust are partner on this um, really exciting project um, that's led by Plymouth City Council. It's funded by the European Regional Development Fund, um, funds urban innovative actions. Um, it's a unique opportunity to bring our experience and enthusiasm for wildlife and nature to the green and the blue spaces in a lovely city, a large city like Plymouth. Um, this project aims to put nature and wildlife at the heart of decisions made around Plymouth's green spaces. It's all about making space for nature while helping local people reconnect with the natural world and getting all the physical and mental health benefits that we know this can bring. So it's a it's a win-win situation, really. Um, look out for future events on the greenminds.com website. You can also come and look out for more activities um, about the Green Minds project. So on to tonight's talk, we're going to be um, hearing about bats and wildlife gardening from Helen, who's our urban ranger for the project. And Helen has uh, lots of experience having worked on the Devon Great Horseshoe Bat project previously. So um, Helen, I'll be handing over to you. Thank you. Hey, thanks. So hopefully you can see my screen okay there? Yeah, all working fine. Great. Okay, well, um, good evening, everyone. Um, I'm going to talk to you tonight about bats and wildlife gardening. Good combination. Uh, as just said, my name's Helen Parr. And I work for Devon Wildlife Trust as uh, the Urban Ranger, great job title, on the Green Mines Project in Plymouth. Before that, though, I was working for the Wildlife Trust on the Devon Greater Horseshoe Bat Project for six years in, in community engagement. So I'm a big fan of bats uh, and I love talking about bats. So I'll try not to go on for too long, but my talk should be about 40, 45 minutes and then time for some questions after. So I'm gonna to talk to you about bats and also touch on how we can all help bats, especially in the way that we do things in our garden and also think about why we'd actually even want to do that. And as Jess was saying, um, this Green Minds project is a citywide project and it's led by Plymouth City Council. Um, there are six other partners on the project. So Devon Wild, I trust one of those, but also the University of Plymouth, the National Trust, Plymouth College of Arts, the Real Ideas Organisation and the Data Place. And there's a reminder of the Green Minds Plymouth website at the bottom there. And here just quickly, a few little pictures of a, a couple there of an event that I attended uh, last week, just showing some of the bits and pieces that we're doing on the project. There's lots going on, uh, but planting native and local species such as these orchard trees in Kiam on the left, um, and then some sort of meadow planting near the Tamar on the right there, is it, all gonna help support wildlife. Um, and one of our key messages on the project is to try and re reduce any reliance on chemicals and pesticides, uh, as this sort of action is vital to prevent the loss of insects, which are basically the building blocks of all our ecosystems. And uh, just on the doom and gloom side, to get that out of the way, we have lost about 50% of all our hedgerows and we've lost about 98% uh, of all our wildflower meadows since the 1950s. So everything we do in our gardens, villages, towns can all help make a difference. Uh, right, so let's just move on. Um, so here's just a few pictures of some UK bats. But Jack, bats in general, I'll talk a bit about bats generally, show you some nice pictures and then go more into UK bats uh, and then about wildlife gardening for bats. So there's actually over 1300 species of bats in the world, more species still being discovered. And be between them, they represent 20% of the, of the world's uh, 5,000 mammal species. So they're a really big and successful species. But uh, sadly, over a thousand of these species are considered at risk. So that's why they're needing our help. Um, and in, globally, bats are really important. And some people say, what's the point of bats? What, what, what do they do for us? Um, but they are really valuable part of a healthy ecosystem and they provide a real value of pest control. For example, in the US, it's been estimated that natural pest control uh, by insects, uh, insects being eaten by bats is worth uh, over $22 billion a year, pretty good. 
a, a pipistrelle bat like the common pipistrelles that we get in our gardens are most likely bat you are to see uh, can eat over 3,000 insects in, just in one night to give you an idea and also our tropical bats uh, help pollinate some of our favorite uh, uh, crops such as cocoa, mango and bananas. The different bat species feed on different things um, that some fruit bats, as the name suggests, feed on fruit. Uh, others uh, feed on nectar. Others just eat insects and some even eat fish and lizards and even other sort of small mammals. Um, there's even three vampire bat species which feed on blood uh, and each sort of different bat species have different adaptations to help them feed. Uh, such as a longer tongue for nectar feeders, big feet for the bats that scoop sort of fish out of the water, and stronger hind legs for the vampire bats because they tend to crawl across the forest floor to find uh, something to prey on. So they're really varied. And just to show you some of that variety, it's nice sort of pictures of bat. This one, a Wahlberg's epauletted fruit bat, some great names. That's found in Africa. Fruit bats tend to be the largest bats. They have large eyes to help them see in the dark as they don't uh, generally use echolocation like many other bat species uh, to find their way around. This is a, the biggest bat in the world. Um, it's a flying fox and it has a wingspan of nearly two meters. So it's pretty enormous. And then of course we have to, uh, have to show you the, the smallest bat as well. This is called Kitty's hognose bat, or common, more commonly known as a bumblebee bat. Uh, and for obvious reasons, the size of it, you can see it sitting on someone's thumb just there, is absolutely tiny and only weighs about uh, two grams. This one's called the heart nose bat, uh, and it's a false vampire bat that lives in Tanzania. Uh, and false vampires were originally thought to drink blood. Um, to feed on blood but actually they eat a range of all sorts of food they don't seem to be very fussy such as rodents birds uh, occasionally insects and they'll even predate on other bats this one's called the mauritian tomb bat i guess it just likes hanging around in tombs uh, and insect eating bats as i said before provide this sort of natural pest control services um, but this here's one of my favorites, uh, the tequila bat. And so this little bat pollinates tequila cacti without which we wouldn't have our favorite Mexican drink. Uh, and some plants actually only flower, their flowers only open at night to, to attract the bats uh, and to them so that they help to pollinate them. And then this little bat, not the most attractive, I think we'll agree, but it's called Seba's short tailed bat. It doesn't weigh much, but is absolutely amazing at dispersing seeds. Uh, so it's quite a common bat in Latin America and it eats uh, fruits that have loads of small seeds in. And so it's been calculated that one bat could actually consume about 60,000 seeds just in one night. Uh, and on average, there's about 400 bats in a colony and they can actually, someone's taken the time to work out that they could disperse almost 9 billion seeds in the course of a year. So even if a tiny fraction of those ever uh, germinate and turn to new seedling, seedlings, that's quite a feat for such a, a small and not very <laughs> attractive looking bat. So bats are, are mammals and they're the only mammals that can really fly. Um, and they're very closely related to humans, you might not believe it, but if you, if you look at bat skeletons, it's very similar to our own. And you can see here that the very long fingers of the bat, uh, which is what makes up the wings, um, uh, that they've adapted to have these really long fingers, not unlike our short fingers, but still they do have four long fingers and a tiny little hook at the top there, you can see, which is actually the thumb. Um, so in then this on this right hand image, you can see a, a bat, that's a greater horseshoe bat uh, making its way towards some prey. But they, they're very agile flyers because they have this stretchy wing membrane between the fingers uh, and, the, and the toes, in fact. So most bats do use echolocation to, to find their food. 
Um, and echolocating, for those who aren't sure about it, is when the bats send out a sound, this could be through their mouth or through their nose in the case of horseshoe bats, and the sound bounces off objects around them, such as trees or uh, people or buildings or hedges or food that they want to eat. And the, the, they have very good hearing, often, most often bats have quite large ears, uh, and they can build up a picture in their mind of where they are, how to get around, what to avoid, and what they want to catch. And so we can measure this sound with special bat detecting equipment. And different bats, for example, in the UK, well, uh, all over the world, uh, echolocate at different frequencies. So this sonogram or sound graph is showing um, uh, the sound of a greater horseshoe bat, which echolocates at 80 uh, kilohertz or 80,000 uh, uh, hertz. And it always has this sort of staple shape, we call it. And it's the only bat in the UK that has this frequency. So when we pick up this sound and see it on a bat detector, we know that we have uh, uh, found a greater horseshoe. And obviously bats are out at night, so it's qu they're quite hard um, to study. So um, here's just another bat, I just like this one. This is um, a yellow winged bat, and this one does use its nose uh, to do its echolocating. You see this really large piece on its nose, which uh, we call a nose leaf. And this is a flexible piece on these bats, and they can direct it a bit to, to sort of um, focus the sound on where it wants to go. So here in the UK, that's sort of a bit of a whistle stop for the global bat picture. Uh, here in the UK, we have uh, 18 different species which have adapted to our climate. So while tropical bats are active all year round, temperate bats um, hibernate um, to save energy in the winter when there's very little food available. Um, and all of our UK bats only eat insects. Uh, and in Devon, we're really lucky because we have um, all but two of the UK's bats, including some quite rare ones, such as this barbastel bat uh, in, the, in the bottom left there, um, and also um, other rare, rarer bats, are the, the horseshoe bats, uh, the grey longed bat, and the Beckstein's bat. Uh, and then the others in this image, you've got the Dorbenton's bat there on the top left. And if you see a bat flying over a lake or, or a, a river and feeding, that's probably a Dorbenton's, that's, that's where they hunt. Uh, and then on the right there, that tiny bat in the palm of a hand is a pipistrelle bat. Um, and that's, as I said before, one of our most common bats. So, yeah, for example, the greater horseshoe bat, as the one in this picture here, um, their numbers, they declined by 90% in the last sort of 80 years or so, which is a huge decline. And then sadly, all of that decline is down to human activity. Um, so that uh, habitat loss is a major factor, uh, development through development and in intensive agriculture and use of pesticides, this sort of combination of things has massively affected um, ha the uh, habitats available for insects. And as the insects are the food for UK bats, it's going to have a, a knock-on effect, a serious knock-on effect on the bat populations. So actually, when you look at all the gardens, private gardens or community spaces in villages and towns, uh, green spaces ar around the country, and you add all that area up, it's a huge potential resource for wildlife. So bats, uh, just like us, they need somewhere to live, somewhere to shelter. So they will use uh, for hibernation in, in the winter. They tend to be in cave systems or in mines and quarries. Um, some stay there in the summer as well, but they'll move to different parts of the cave. But uh, quite a number of bats like somewhere a bit warmer in the summer to roost, such as in old buildings and roofs, and that's so that they can have their young. So this, this would be where we'd find a lot of the maternity roosts. Um, and other bats uh, will use trees. So trees are, are a fantastic um, resource for bats to use, to roost in and shelter in. Uh, and then they need food. So they need somewhere to hunt and somewhere where they're gonna find some food. <laughs> so uh, woods, Woodlands are great for, for shelter, roosting, and there's insects obviously that live in woods or particularly on the wooden edges. 
Um, hedges are really important uh, for bats to navigate their way and find their way around the countryside at night in the dark. And also hedges harbour lots of potential food for the bats, the insects. And meadows are obviously, as I mentioned, we don't have that many true, wild, you know, really good wildflower meadows left, but meadows uh, provide great uh, habitats for insects. And so that's obviously going to attract the bats in. Uh, and I've mentioned gardens as well. I couldn't do this talk without showing my favourite picture of a the close up face of a greater horseshoe bat. You can see that incredible nose leaf uh, on there. Uh, and the eyes of this bat are just kind of just visible behind that nose leaf and you can see its little mouth there and its very large ears. And so the greater horseshoe uses its nose to make echolocating sounds. Um, its favourite foods are moths and beetles and it's one of our bigger UK bats and can actually live up to 30 years which isn't bad for a, a pretty small mammal. And all bats including greater horseshoes only can only have one baby or pup at a time uh, and often they'll only reproduce every other year. So if numbers crash or if there's a problem um, the population is quite slow to increase even when conditions are good. Bats are amazing predators. Again it's a horseshoe bat here. Um, it has very sharp little teeth as you can see in that in that tiny skull there um, and they have a powerful jaw for sort of biting through uh, hard, crunchy, big insects. Um, and greater horseshoes are different from smaller bats, which pipple turtles, for example, will fly around, catch and eat their food on the wing. But because the greater horseshoes need to catch something like this moth that you can see in the picture, um, the bat is scooping up the moth in its wing first. It then transfer that uh, to its mouth and then it'll go and hang upside down on a tree somewhere along a, a hedgerow perhaps if there's a tree standing along there uh, and then it'll dismember them, drop all the crunchy bits like the wings and the, the head and so on and it eat them off inside so it's actually quite useful where we know bats are roosting we can have a look and see what they've left behind and it can help us identify what bats are using that area. The great to horseshoe bat for example it feed, it's specifically likes particular things and so if those things aren't available the bats especially the female bats uh, when they're trying to provide for their young they will have to fly further and further from their roost and they'll be more tired they'll have less energy they won't raise such healthy young uh, so it's really important that they have these foods available and they will eat things like uh, moths uh, cockchafer beetles uh, dung beetles, crane flies, and, and some types of wasps. So bats, although they're predators, they can also be prey, uh, and these are their main predators. Uh, sparrowhawks and barn owls, and sadly, pet cats are probably the worst uh, thing uh, predator of, of bats in, in the UK. So just on to gardening. This is just a lovely example of a community project that I was involved with on the bat project in Chudley and near the where we know that the maternity roost of the bats are, Chudley rocks if you know Chudley at all, we, there was a, a, a green space which wasn't really being used for anything and so the local community group uh, put together and we supported it with a bit of funding a garden design and actually it's actually in a horseshoe shape <laughs> the planting and that you can just see on the right and I should have put a picture in but they got they had a greater horseshoe bat bench commissioned so it looks like you're sort of sitting in the wings of, of the bat which is lovely but the most important thing was that they planted lots of pollinator friendly plants um, which they knew would attract insects and that that, that would be a, a good thing to do for bats and also I should stress that a, a good, if you're gardening for bats you're also going to be gardening for lots of other wildlife uh, as any garden can connect and provide a wildlife corridor if it links up with other gardens for, for many species. Uh, so not just insects, but also butterflies, moths, um, hedgehogs. Um, here we've got in the top right, one of my favorite moths, there's an elephant hawk moth, it's really beautiful. And in the bottom, there's a tiger moth. So if you want your garden to be good for wildlife, 
there's two things I would recommend. One is mess <laughs> and one is variety. So messy areas and longer grass um, provide shelter and food for insects and small mammals. And a really good variety of different types of shapes and size of flowers will attract a range of different insects because um, different insects will have like different sized tongues and different things that they feed on maybe at different times of year. So I wouldn't really recommend using the traditional bedding plants um, or double headed sort of fancy varieties uh, like petunias and some of the geraniums. I mean, they're colorful and by all means have them in your garden, but they won't provide any really hardly any nectar pollen for, for insects. So that's, that's just the way it is. So I would say if you really want every plant to count as it were for wildlife, always go for native species and you won't go far wrong. And also just never use chemicals in your garden. And I think we all have just sort of naturally done that in the past because you go into gardens and you see all these things and you're meant to treat this and treat that and weeds and everything else. But it, it does always harm wildlife. And so it's really good to either stop completely or at least try and gradually sort of cut those out of your your gardening and, and or by the way if you always try and buy peat free compost because our precious sort of peat bogs which are amazing carbon stores are becoming sort of few and far between because they're still being cut uh, to, and peat is being used in compost so those are really really good things that we can all do. The big debate on mowing grass <laughs> um, we again we all used to seeing a beautifully mown sort of lawns uh lovely and green really short but to, when i see that now i just think it's a bit of a, a desert for insects a bit of a wasteland for wildlife and so while there's a place for mown grass in your garden it depends on what you're using your garden for i guess i would just say that any uh cutting grass a bit higher cutting grass less frequently or hardly at all uh, and removing cuttings when you do cut um, is, a, is a quite a good way because if you take the cuttings away you start to reduce uh, fertility of the soil and maybe other plants could come in because um, often grass if we sow amenity type grass it can be very thick uh, and there's not much else that can get in there um, or maybe just start gradually shrinking your area of grass by sort of putting maybe some areas on the edge or starting to plant some uh, wildflowers and, and gra native grasses and, and things like that. So that's mowing, a bit controversial. Um, bug hotels are a sort of fun, fun thing to do in your garden and they can attract, they can be simple, they can be complicated and they can attract all sorts of of lovely wildlife like in some of the pictures on the on the side there including that lovely snow worm. we found a tiny little baby two centimeters long slow worm on our patio the other day and it's just, just great to see and they often love being in compost heaps as well so compost heaps are pretty good as well um and i, I love looking for pictures of good bug hotel examples so i just put these in uh, I, this upper one i haven't been there myself but this is from sweden it's like it's just like an amazing insect wall boundary i thought that was brilliant i never really seen anything like that over here uh, but then the other two are from the uk i've seen these ones faulty flowers on the bottom left there that, i saw that at the eden project uh, and that more fancy one is in hyde park uh, in london would be london wouldn't it? so there it just shows if you're creative I, i'd never be able to make that but the other one, possibly, if you've got a couple of old pallets and you just sort of stuff it full with natural materials, uh, like old tiles and bricks with holes in, bamboo canes sort of cut short, for, and then um, uh, bees can go and, and lay uh, their larvae in there. So there's just lots of fun you can have with it. Or you could just have a pile of twigs in the corner of your garden, and that would still provide um, shelter for insects. You could make a bug bench if, or a, you, if you were making a bench in your garden why not put some things underneath it for insects as long as you don't mind them flying around your legs when you're sitting on it and if really if you're only going to do one thing providing some sort of water feature in a garden is one of the best things you can do for wildlife 
Uh, and you literally, you could put some water out in a tiny bowl and within a few days, it's gonna be used. So you can have a great big pond like the one on the left. Um, don't put fish in it though, because they tend to eat anything else that's in there. Um, but you want different levels, uh, shallow and deep. So anything that gets into that your pond or bowl can get out again. Or you could just sink a tub or an old washing up bowl into the grass. Uh, and it will soon um, have it, uh, attract uh, insects to it. All good food for bats. And then don't, no worries if you don't have a garden or only a tiny patch or a balcony, there's some ways of using the sort of vertical space of, with some hanging baskets or pots, um, or maybe using a pallet or create a trellis to uh, create, uh, well, lots of color, uh, lots that you could do this with herbs, you could put edible things such as tomatoes and strawberries and grow salad in troughs. There's lots of, of ways to, to get involved if you want to. And then some people like to put that bird and bat boxes. Bats are a bit fussy about bat boxes, so I couldn't guarantee it would be used. But I think if you want bats to be using your garden, the best thing is to get the insects into your garden and then the bats will follow. Um, but I like this image in the middle of a, uh, it's like a log store with a, a green roof on it. I thought that was really cool. And birds, feeding the birds is obviously good and fun. Lots of us do that, but you can make your own bird feeders. Um, just have to be careful with bird feeders to keep them really clean and because they can, you're encouraging birds to all gather together and they can pass on disease. And, um, I've just got some examples of some really nice sort of insect friendly planting species there, but don't worry to remember all those. We'll, we'll send out a follow up email um, after, uh, after the talk and we'll add some of the resources and, and information for you um, so you can follow up if, you, if you're interested. And actually, as part of the BAT project, we did have our own website, devonbatproject.org. And although the project is finished, the website's still functional. So you can go onto that uh, and you can, if you search on it for stars of the night, there's a nice booklet you can download about bats uh, uh, with some ideas for species planting. Uh, and there's other information on the website. So there's like some videos and there's downloads and there's some uh, games and things like that. So there's lots of information there. And in terms of finally, of just other information, um, the Green Minds website, greenmindsplymouth.com has lots more about the project and events that are happening in Plymouth uh, and some resources. And on the Devon Wildlife Trust website, we've got our Take Action for Insects campaign, which I highly recommend signing up to as you get a guide uh, to, uh, an individual guide or you can get a community guides and actually there's um, a, a school's guide as well uh, of loads of things you can do to help insects um, and also there's a gardening for wildlife section and you can download that guide in the top right there uh, to wildlife gardening um, and finally at the bottom there if you're interested in finding out more about bats and British bats then I recommend the Bat Conservation Trust website um, that's got a ton more information about bats. Um, and that's it. So thank you for listening. Um, I hope you found that interesting and get some ideas, but I just encourage people to do anything is better than doing nothing in terms of helping uh, wildlife in your garden. Thanks very much. That was great. Thank you very much, Helen. Um, I think my favorite bit, I made a little note, they, um... The bug hotel i saw it actually had teacups and teapot lids in it as well so um yeah insects will will use anything really won't they <laughs> um so we've got a few questions here um okay let's see so um first of all is there a way that you can find out which plants would be traditionally native to devon specifically rather than generally native you um, can probably answer that better than me, <laughs> I, I, I had a little think about that one. Um, I think that we've probably got a few plants in Devon that are specific to Devon, but are quite rare. So I think most of the ones that you might end up in your garden are going to be um, ones that are probably reasonably common throughout the, the southwest or south, south of the country. Um, yeah. So I wouldn't worry too much about ones that are um, sort of exclusively Devon. 
um yeah i find any of those sort of cottage garden type plants are usually good ones to go for aren't they or sort yeah. of herbs and lavenders and things like that yeah um i think variety is key always isn't it have all yeah. those the yeah. different types of flowers for all the different insects um we've got another one here presumably dead trees are also good for bats to roost in or is it just living trees yeah well they they can i mean they can even just roost behind some ivy on a tree so yes they will need to or behind a piece of bark that's flaking off a tree i mean they're that small than especially the pipistrels so yeah and and any dead wood like that a dead tree especially if it's standing dead wood is fantastic for invertebrates so it's going to be great for all sorts of um, wildlife that would be using it yeah, certainly old dead trees are a fantastic habitat for a variety of creatures, aren't they? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, one here about bats' wings. Um, how easily do membrane tears heal? Oh, that's a good question. Yeah. But so there are a, there's a network of bat carers across the country um, and they get a lot of bats in with a tear like that. And that would be caused by cats mainly. So when cats they might know where the bats are roosting if they're in a building and they just sit outside and just wait for the bats to fly out at, at, at sunset. And so they can slash at their wings and they can kill bats, but also they can tear. But those bats can actually be taken into to a bat carer or a bat carer can pick them up. The, the Bat Conservation Trust have a helpline for that. Uh, and they can be nursed back to help. But I, I don't think they often have great horseshoe bats because I think they, they don't tend to survive that sort of trauma or whatever happens to them but they they can but and some bats will carry on with a little hole in their wing I think but obviously it's better not to and we try and if people have got cats as obviously lots of people do we we just say oh perhaps just if you know there's a roost nearby or keep keep your cat in at just at sunset which is when bats tend to be all leaving their roosts um, and maybe put a bell on a collar if they wear a collar and, and that at least that can allow, give the uh, wildlife a chance <laughs> to escape. Yeah, I said, I, I know I live in town and there's a, there's a few bats around and I've seen some uh, in the park in summer when I sort of walk my dogs late. And um, I remember seeing one and you could actually see as it was flying, I could see through its wing. It had a little hole mm. and it still seemed to be flying <clears> fine. So they, they do heal remarkably yeah. well actually and it's astonishing how long bats live I, I always yes. amaze me when you think of how long like a tiny mouse would survive but and, and the bats are a similar size and they yeah even a tiny pipistrel bat can um, live up to 16 years I mean that's probably more than the average in the wild but they they're really long lived and I we think that's because they hibernate and and so they sleep a lot <laughs> in the in the daytime as well and they don't have very many young um just infrequently like one a year one every two years and so that just they just tend to live longer i think would you agree with that jess is that why yeah so <laughs> so that ability to to slow down um through daytime and winter and, and the low reproduction rate certainly helps to to extend their lives yes and, yeah and their heart rate just drops to about four beats a minute or something du during those sort of winter months so they're just conserving lots of energy but um i did uh chatting to someone last week and they asked me a, a good question and i i'd seen this before she said she'd seen bats out in the middle of the day just recently and i remember i've seen that in cornwall around the coast path middle of the day bats out and what are they doing because they're like going to be predated on if they're not careful but I, I think you might know Jess it's because they've just come out of hibernation they're absolutely starving <laughs> and so they they're prepared to take the risk of being predated on just to get start getting some food into them after their long winter months of not feeding very much yeah I, I think I'd agree with that it's um although it's not usual it's not uncommon to see them during the day and um, it is uh, obviously they're at greater risk during the day but as you say particularly now after we had that lovely warm spell last week um they'll all be sort of going oh oh spring is here and um starting to wake and up they'll, and yeah, they'll be, be really i've hungry. seen like clouds of little midges and insects out so yeah the the, the food yeah. is starting to be there for bats but they even in the winter actually we say hibernation but actually they more go into deep sleep or torpor and they do pop in and out of that in the winter 
I've quite often, uh, because Devon is pretty mild county compared to other parts of the country, I've often seen bats just sort of flying past in you know, and driving along, just spot them in the middle of winter on a, on a quite a mild sort of winter's day. Yeah, as long as they can still sort of replenish some of their energy stores um, and they don't wake up too much, they can, yeah, they can do that through winter. Um, Helen, what is, so going back to cats, what's your opinion on outside roaming cats, considering they cause so much trouble for wildlife? I think you've sort of said that a little yeah. bit, keeping I them think, in certain I times. mean, there are millions of pet cats, aren't there? And, and they, they kill millions of <laughs> birds and other wildlife, you know, so every year. So it, it's better if they don't, but it is a tricky one because we can't tell everyone to keep their cats in all the time. But I think with bats, certainly you can just not let them out at particular times um, when they're most likely to do all that killing <laughs> nighttime, I suppose. Um, and uh, a question here or, or a message, um, going back to the Devon Great Horseshoe Bat Project website, um, obviously the website's still there, but there isn't anyone on the other end of, uh, I think someone's got a, a, maybe an old email address, but it, that's not manned anymore. No, no, it's not, unfortunately. There, there is some other work going on around um, bats, doing some bat surveys. So we had a really, some people here might have taken part in our Devon bat survey where we had static detectors that we put out to collect bat data and some of that's going on as part of another project uh, within the wildlife trust called saving devon's treescapes so if people want to look up that project page on the wildlife trust website um, there might be opportunities to get involved in that it, it's just taking place in certain project areas but it is it's uh, yeah that's a good project and they're just doing some monitoring and that's all projects all based around ash dieback and and tree nurseries and communities and getting involved. So there's some good stuff going on there. And basically any improvements in any habitats is gonna be good for bats because of the improvement in numbers of insects because um, our insect numbers are really, uh, really have plummeted. And so we can all do our bit to try and help with that. It's quite hard. Bats like insects that aren't seen as a very sort of sexy topic sometimes, are they? Everyone likes hedgehogs. Um, but you know, need everything else to make the whole system work well. Yeah. So um, yeah, Devon Bat Survey. You can you can look that one up. And if the information hasn't been updated yet, we'll it'll be starting um, very soon, probably in the next next few weeks. We have to wait till um, we know all the bats are awake before we uh, start start recording. Um, here's an interesting one: Are bats affected by artificial lights in gardens? Yes, they are. So bats don't do don't particularly like great horseshoe bats. I know more about than other bats, but they are really disturbed by light and noise. So one thing that is a problem for not just bats but lots of nocturnal wildlife um, is the security lights that flash come on and off automatically because that can really disturb them if they're sort of flying by and they get this like massive bright light sort of suddenly confusing them. Um, but it really affects moths as well. The moths are like you know, everyone knows about butterflies and we have about 60 species of butterflies in the UK. But what people don't realise is, I can't remember the number now, 1100, is it, moss species, something it's like that? Around there. We have a huge numbers of moss species uh, and about actually more day flying moths than there are butterflies even and the rest are out at night. Um, and so they get really confused by the, the by street lights. And I think there's lots of research around the males end up flying up too high because of the lights and the females are down below and they don't actually even meet up for mating. So it has these massive like knock on effects. So it's always better to aim for darkness if you can. Uh, if, if you just automatically leaving a light on, you don't need to, then just turn it off because it's better for it's better for us as well, because there's lot again, there's lots of research on how our natural circadian rhythms have been totally affected by all the artificial light that we look at all, all evening in our homes and on our screens. Apart from this, obviously. Apart from this, which is fine. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, one about bat boxes. If putting up bat boxes, what is the best orientation and is it different for hibernation and breeding? Oh, so bat boxes, I would normally, yeah, sort of think of them as being for breeding perhaps 
because they, they in the winter time bats tend to disappear off and hibernate in the sort of colder places really but that what I understand is they you can face them any way but north <laughs> so I guess you might be able to add to that but because north facing not so good because for the, for the if it's going to be used for some breeding I mean greater horseshoe bats don't use bat boxes I should say that they, they much may need a much bigger space to get into but um, little pipstrails and other bats will um, go in and but Jess, you, you do quite a lot of bat box checking and stuff in your work, don't you? So you might have some interesting stuff to add on that or things that you found in bat boxes. Um, I'd say there's there's lots of really good um, resources. I think the Bat Conservation Trust probably has some good advice on their website. Um, and it'll help you also choose the different um, bat box styles for different bats, because some of our bats use slightly different bat boxes. Um, and yeah, so like as as you would imagine, you know, with bird boxes or other things, you don't necessarily want them in absolute direct sunlight all the time, but you don't want them um, on the sort of colder side as well. So usually something that has got a little bit. So so it can be nice and warm. So what bats really like for um, maternity roost is a nice warm warm place, um, but not something that the temperature is going to massively change all the time. So um, I think. So yeah, find some advice for the bat box that you're going to put up. But yes, if you can avoid direct sunlight and avoid um, the sort of coldest side, then then that's you're, you're going to. But they still might not have a better use chance. Them. They no, are they, quite fussy. And sometimes they? they don't use them for a very long time, and then they might mm. suddenly decide they suddenly discover it and decide it's the place to be. So, well, they might just stop over and use it as a temporary roost because bats have lots of little temporary roosts as well as their main roost, don't they? They do. And even, you know, when they, they do breed in them, sometimes they'll only stay for a couple of weeks and then it'll be a, a small um, colony, obviously not, not one of the, the huge, big, great horseshoe bat maternity colonies we see, but maybe a small one, it might even move on quite quickly from there. So, um, yes, but remember that you can't check in a bat box without a licence as well so yeah it's best you need to kind of look more for evidence at the entrance yes. don't you of scratching or maybe some marking from the like, urine or something like that or dropping some, somewhere um so next question um and i said it's a silly question but it isn't no such thing no um if you're using a basic bat detector outside um where you see bats flying close are the bats affected by the bat detector noise that we hear um Oh, I've been asked this before, but I don't think they would be because it, it's brought down to a much lower pitch to allow us to hear it. Yeah, Do you so agree our, with that, Jess? Yeah, the heterodyne bat detectors, um, obviously we can't hear bats, they're sort of, some of our most common ones are sort of in the 45 to 50 kilohertz um, range, and we can only hear, so small children can maybe hear up to 20 kilohertz. Um, so what it does is it, I think they sort of divide the frequency by about 10 so it brings it down into our range of hearing um, so the bats can hear that but to them it doesn't sound like another bat anymore if that makes sense you know if, if you took our voices and slow the free like change the frequency by by 10 uh, we wouldn't recognize it as voices anymore either so um people say if you're outside and bats come close i've heard sometimes because when we're outside um you know when you go outside on a nice warm evening and you get a whole load of midges around you um that's going to bring bats in too so maybe that's why they're coming closer to you with a bat detector is you're actually attracting some some midges swatting them away and the bats are coming in help you get rid of them they have when you are listening with the detector what i love is if you just listen often you'll hear the little pipistrelle bats are easy to spot because they often come out earliest and they just flit, I'm trying to show on my screen, flit around like really fast back and forth, whereas other bigger bats tend to just fly more along the straight line and they're gone. And then when you're listening to the detector, um, as they catch something, they have they make this amazing little noise called a feeding buzz. Uh, it's like a little raspberry sound, isn't it, Jess? Uh, and so that's quite fun to listen out for. And you actually almost can watch them doing that just before it gets really dark. So yeah, I re recommend if you're interested just get a little simple handheld detector and just switch it to about 45 kilohertz uh, and see what you pick up um, even on the worst sort of day of weather in a bat walk we always seem to pick up a pipistrelle bat even if we don't pick up anything else and if you are in Plymouth we are going to be planning some um, bat bat walk events 
through this summer so keep an eye on on the website yeah, there's one there. on the website um which will get booked up really quickly so it will. Um, <laughs> i recommend uh, booking on as quickly as you can and then but if you find you can't then make it near the time please cancel your booking so that we can get someone else in in your place um so for a wildlife garden um what is a rough proportion of good nectar and pollen plants a um well i'm not sure but i don't really understand the question but i so, think like a, 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 any mix i don't know enough detail about that but as much as possible i'd say <laughs> i think it's if if you're thinking about the insects obviously you need the flowers and the nectar but also you do need a few long grasses as well and um because there's lots of uh so butterflies and insects like um the grasses and particularly because the grasses grow quite close um, so if you do cut things back in the winter, but you leave leave sort of some of the, the base stems, they can create some really nice little habitats for um, insects over winter as well. Yeah, we tend to get a bit fixated on the whole wildflowers and people imagining all these incredible swathes of colour, don't they, of poppies and corn flower, cockle, I don't know, all sorts of things. But um, the, yeah, when we plant uh, meadows, we tend to go for a mix um, of 80% grasses with 20% wildflowers because once you've got a really good establishment of the grasses your meadow kind of takes care of itself whereas some of these more showy colourful things will it, are there only annuals so they won't necessarily be like that every year without you having to sort of replenish the stock so the grasses are, are important too as Jess was saying. Um, so Sue says that she made a wildlife garden during lockdown. Well done, Sue. Um, we had a bat in our garden last year. Uh, do they have a large flying range as we've not seen more and we're quite urban, although not far from fields? Yeah, they can. So the greater horseshoe bats can fly, I think it's like 15 kilometres out in a night or it might even be further than that. Uh, they have quite a large range because they have to fly further to get like some nice big juicy beetles and moths and things whereas the pipistrels can just scoot around in your garden because there'll be little clouds of midges um in terms of seeing them yeah i mean they do go around to do they are quite loyal to things like their maternity roosts and their winter roosts but they do just have this sort of temporary roosts as well so um yeah if, if you're doing wildlife gardening and keep it up I'm sure that you'll spot them again and don't forget of course of all the bats that will be flying over when it's completely dark and you can't see them so we're only able to really spot them in that dusky twilight uh, after that you know remember they've got the whole rest of the night to be flying over your garden but you just won't notice that they're there um, and speaking of seeing the bats, um, someone said, is there a more appropriate head torch colour, e.g. red light, to wear during sunset sunrise surveys? Oh, I don't know the answer to that. Jess, you might know more than me. Um, red light is certainly less disturbing to bats than white light, although um, some bats can still see the red light. Um, I Well, having done quite a lot of surveys in the past, um, you uh, basically, you try to sort of learn to write without looking, um, if you need to write down what you're seeing, um, because you don't want to be pointing torches at the bats, you, 